Hello everyone, I'm Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba, and this is Experiment Designs for Computer Science. In this video, I'm going to explain what are point indicators. By the way, this video and the next one will be a bit mathematical. If you have any difficulty, remember that you can pause and rewind the video. And don't forget to ask questions in the office hours. So, in the last video, we explained that a statistic is a function calculated from experimental data. A point indicator is a type of statistic. Formally, we say that a point indicator is a, the statistic that provides the value of maximum plausibility of a given population parameter. What does this mean? Let's say that we have a model M and we have a parameter theta in this model. For example, the mean of height of students in the university. A point indicator will calculate an estimate for this parameter from the data that we obtained in our experiment. So we say that theta hat is an estimation of the parameter theta for the population x. There are many different point indicators that we use in science and engineering to calculate parameters of interest in our models. Some parameters that we are interested in calculating include the mean of a population, the variance, the proportion of some value, the difference between two populations, etc. One thing that is important to note is that for each of these parameters, there may be more than one way to calculate the estimate. We are going to talk more about this in a second. The value calculated by the point indicator is a random variable, and it depends on the sample. This means that, if we are really unlucky, the estimated that we calculated can be very different from the true parameter. For example, imagine again that we want to calculate the average height of the students of the University of Tsukuba. But, because we are a little bit lazy, we did our experiment using only students from our circle. Unfortunately, we are in the basketball circle, so you can imagine that the value calculated in, by our statistic will be much higher than what we imagine is the true value of the mean height parameter. <clears throat> anyway, when we talk about the difference between the estimated value and the true value, we want to separate this difference into two components, the error and the bias. The error is the natural change that happens because of the variation in our observations. The bias, on the other hand, is a systematic difference between the estimate and the true value. Let's see an example of statistical bias. Okay, we're back again with the calculate the height of the student's example. This time, in our experiment, we choose 10 students truly randomly from the entire university, and we calculate the height of each student. Usually, you think to use the average of the sample, but just to understand the concept of bias better, let's consider two other statistics to calculate the value of the height parameter from the data in the sample. The first one that we will consider is to use the height of the shortest of the 10 students as our representative height. The second statistic is to use the height of only one of the 10 students in the sample at random. Now, think about these two statistics for a little bit. You can see that the first one, take the smallest student, will give us a value that's usually smaller than the value of the true parameter of the model. Not always, by the way. For example, let's say that we take all the students from the basketball team. The smallest of them will still be higher than the average. But if you think about it, in general, this minimum statistic will give us a value that is smaller than the true value. So this is why it's a biased estimator. What can we say about the second one? Think about it for a second. What are the characteristics of the second estimator, the height of a random observation of one student? Okay, so what are 
unbiased estimators. An unbiased estimator is a statistic, a function from the data, that when it has an error, this error is equally distributed above and below the true value. We can describe this mathematically by saying that the difference between the expected value of the estimator and the true value of the parameter is zero. Let's use this concept to explain why the average is an unbiased estimator for the mean parameter of the population. Let's call our sample to be composed of the observations x1, x2, xn, and x bar is the average that we calculate from the sample. Remember that the true parameter that we are trying to estimate is the mean of the population, which we are going to call mu. Now, the definition of the mean mu is that the mean is the expected value of a single observation. So for each of these observations, x1, x2, xn, the expected value is mu. So, when, so we can calculate the expected value of the average like this. The expected value of the average is the expected value of the sum of the observations divided by the size of the sample. Since the expect expected value of the sum of the, observ of the observations is mu, the sum of all observations, the, uh, the sum of the expected value would be mu times n, and we are dividing this by n, so the expected value of the average becomes mu too. This shows that the sample average is an unbiased estimator of the, co the population mean. But if you think about it, it's not hard to define several unbiased estimators for a given parameter. For example, I can think of the following unbiased estimator. The average of 10 observations, the average of 20 observations, the average of 30 observations. If we think about the average, another one would be, for example, the maximum observation of a sample plus the minimum observation of a sample divided by two. So we have 10 students, we just take the tallest one, the smallest one, and divide it by two. If we do the same calculation that we did in the last slide, this estimator will also be unbiased. Okay. <clears throat> Another unbiased estimator of the mean would be simply the value of one single observation. All these estimators are unbiased, but some of them have higher variance than others. Some estimators will have a very big variance, some estimators will have a very small variance. Usually, we want an estimator that is both unbiased and has a variance that is as small as possible. Since we want an estimator with as small variance as possible, this means that we can calculate the standard error in the variance of an estimator. Please note here that we are not talking about the standard error of the sample or of the standard error of the observation or the population. We are talking about the standard error of the estimator, the standard error of the function that is used to calculate this value. To calculate the standard error of the estimator, we use the sample mean as an error. If you think about it, this means that the standard error of the estimator is itself an estimate. This recursion can go very deep if you let it, let it. The important thing, though, is that we want to know the standard error of our estimators to evaluate how useful they are. Here are some formulas of how we calculate the standard error of the mean, the standard error of the variance, and the standard error of the standard deviation of estimators of these three values. Note here that in these formulas, S means the error calculated from the sample, which means we calculate the average of the sample, and then we subtract it from the value of each observation, and that will be the error from that sample. This is usually used as an estimate for the uh, variance or the standard error of the entire population. You can have see more information here. Let's see a quick example. Consider a factory that produces cable. We want to check that the process in this factory is consistent. 
let's assume that the process of cable fabrication should, in theory, produce cables with a mean resistance of 50 ohms and a variance of 4 ohms. So this is how we will describe this model. To verify if the factory production is consistent, we do an experiment where we take 25 cables from the factory and we measure their resistance. The sample mean would be calculated as x bar equals 1 over the sample size times the sum of the sample values. This sample mean, as we discussed before, would follow a normal distribution with expected value 50 ohms and a standard error equal to 0 0.4 ohms. Note here that the standard error of the sample is smaller than the error of the population. Why? Well, this is natural because we are calculating the average of many observations. This will reduce the sample error and is something that we want to manipulate and study better in the future. Now, before we finish, I want to quickly touch on a topic that is very important, which is the central limit theorem. This is the reason that the error of the sample is smaller than the error of a single observation. But the, the central limit theorem goes beyond that. Remember that for the cable example, we assumed that the distribution of the resistance value for the cable production followed a normal curve. Because of that, the distribution of the average also follows a normal curve. Normal distributions have some very nice properties. So whenever possible, we want our statistics to follow normal distributions. But how hard is it to make a statistic that follows normal distributions? Well, the key idea of the central limit theorem is that the distribution of the mean of a sample will be approximately normal even when the underlying population does not follow a normal distribution. There are some exceptions for this idea, but it works for a surprising amount of distributions. In general, if you calculate the mean of a sample that is large enough, the distribution of that mean will be close to normal. Not the distribution of the observations, the distribution of the estimate. Pay attention to this point. Distribution of the observations, distribution of the mean. Distribution of the observations, distribution of the estimate of the mean. Okay, two different things. See this link here in the materials for more information regarding the CLT. We will not be studying the CLT itself in this course, but a lot of techniques that we will use in this course rely on the CLT for their effectiveness. So it's worth to understand it to a certain degree. Okay. This is where we will end this video. In the next one, I will talk about interval estimators and, in particular, confidence intervals. See you there.